A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a tragic miscarriage of justice on a case that we have been following on this podcast. Remember the woman who was decapitated on a public street by her abusive ex-boyfriend, a crime that was witnessed by so many innocent bystanders? Well, he was rightfully convicted of her murder. And now that same man has been found not guilty by reason of mental illness by a judge. How is this justice? But first, it's the arrest everyone is obsessed with. The family man and successful architect from New York who has been arrested and charged with three murders in the Gilgo Beach area of Long Island. Police say the suspected killer was living a double life using burner phones to hook up with sex workers and escorts while his wife was away. Part of the evidence used to identify him, a discarded pizza box with the pizza inside. We are recording this on Wednesday, July 26th of 2023. Our guest today is Robert Corbett, a former prosecutor and a current criminal defense attorney, dear friend of the show, based in North Carolina. Robert, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. Um, We've got a series of cases here which are frustrating and honestly bewildering bewildering, you know, because I I know we're going to get into the decapitation case in a second, but it's extraordinary to me that the murder can be clearly witnessed, that the man was abusive for so long, tormented this woman, is found guilty. And then the judge says, well, you know what? That's true. Guilty. But, you know, they're kind of crazy. So I'm sorry. You know, we're reversing this. It's such an injustice. Well, those types of cases are rare or perhaps i should say being successful from the defense side it is rare that a person is found not guilty by reason of insanity or some type of mental infirmity i think nationwide it is less than than five percent of those cases or aware of less than five percent of defendants who assert that defense are able to prevail But in this particular case, what you have that he was found responsible for the killing because the trial is a two step process, but that the judge found based on the testimony from the experts that it suffered, the defendant has suffered some type of traumatic brain injury, the failure to properly take his medication and other things in combination, those experts believed to a scientific degree of certainty that he did not appreciate the wrongfulness of his acts. Um, oh, so I certainly understand boy. why people would, the outrage that the, the public can feel about this particular case. Oh, outrage is just the just the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. We're going to discuss that after we discuss our top case, which everyone is talking about. There are new developments nearly every hour of every day on this. It's amazing. What we're talking about is a case out of New York where... There has been an arrest in a case that has gripped this community, and equally as shocking as the murders are, are all, it, it is really the evidence, what they are saying is the evidence, and the person whom they have arrested here. So we're talking about the Gilgo Beach serial killer case on Long Island, and for 13 years, police have been hunting a serial killer who taunted relatives, even called them called them with the victim's cell phone and tortured them by telling them what he had done to them. Now, what's fascinating to everyone is that the person who's been arrested here appears to be a family man, a successful man. He is an architect in Manhattan. He's rather goofy looking, kind of tall, middle-aged man with khaki pants, the kind of guy you sit next to on a commuter train. And that's what he did. He commuted every day to Manhattan. So I think this is what is baffling everyone is how does a seemingly average person, how can this one be the one charged as a serial killer? 
Well, I think there are a lot of things to unpack in this particular case. For instance, when you talk about his, his general appearance, I think it goes to show that there's not just one, one look or one stereotype of how a person is supposed to look or act um, when they've been accused of committing such horrific crimes. Um, and I think the other thing is the double life that he led all of these years, certainly, as you said, horrific acts to uh, torment the family, to call them, to tell them what he had done, but to lead the similarly, um, you know, in terms of middle class or upper, upper middle class lifestyle with a wife and family, um, having his own business and to keep that up for over this period of time. I think that's one of the things in terms of it captivates the the interest of the public in, in something like this. It's it really is incredible because I, and I know this is just a little beside the point, but I, I was in New York when he was arrested. I was actually on vacation and he was arrested in Massapequa Park. And like my phone blew up because all my cousins are out there and mm. they're like beside themselves. The alleged serial killer has been captured here and. It, it's it's such a huge case for this local community. I just read this morning that the mayor of the town has um, is making moves to see if he can purchase the house because it has become a tourist attraction in the last few weeks. A man was just arrested on July 13th, but already they have cops stationed there. And anyone who stops or gets out, I just read, to even look at the house or photograph the house will be issued a loitering ticket because the town has had it. The community has had it. So it's just a lot of dynamics, a lot of dynamics. Now we're learning he had a giant vault with 279 weapons, a walk-in vault, which I would say to you, and we haven't even gotten to the details of who he is yet, but it's kind of hard to believe that you could hide something like that in your house. Like the rest of the family must have known that this walk-in vault existed. Yeah, certainly um, you think in terms of, if not his family in terms of children, but his wife in terms of being with him for all this time has to know something in terms of something like that in the house. And not only just when you say something like that in the house, but has to know or suspect um, over this period of time of the type of man that he was or is or the type of things that he could possibly commit. There has to be some insight or something that she would have gleaned or, or had seen that in hindsight, at least someone could say, okay, I can start putting the pieces together. I can start connecting those dots. And police say in, the, in all the records that have been released, police and investigators say that these murders occurred when the wife was out of town or out of the country, which I find fascinating. Additionally, since he was arrested, and again, it's only been a few weeks, she's already filed for divorce. So there are there. I mean, there is so much going on here. OK, so let's get to the facts as as have been presented by police. We want to make sure that everyone knows he has entered a plea of not guilty. OK, so on July 13th, police arrested 59 year old Rex Hewerman in Manhattan outside of his architecture firm. The news of his arrest, though, didn't break until the next day. Married, father of two, worked in the city, commuted on the train back and forth to Massapequa Park. Again, this is the kind of neighborhood where all the houses are very nice. And what stood out about his house was his was in horrible condition. This is the house was an eyesore. You know, it was falling down in disrepair and certainly in comparison to all the other homes. And the neighbors have said and said this to several news organizations and and has been shared over and over again. They used to joke about, you know, that's the house where a killer lives. And on Halloween, people wouldn't even let their kids go to this house. Not so funny when you um, now hear that the man has been arrested and charged with three murders and suspected in a total of four. Sorry, but kind of shows you in terms of when you talk about in terms of the neighbors, people who would see him on a daily basis, someone who lives in the neighborhood that you might say, well, no, we couldn't suspect or didn't suspect he could commit this type of crime. But there was something definitely off about him, off of his presentation, off of how they, they live. Something is off about the people in that house to the point that they're saying that I don't even want my kids to go over there. Absolutely. Something very off without question. 
without question, though everyone commented about how they saw him every morning, grab his briefcase, and head off to the Long Island Railroad. And what's interesting is, you know, he was very distinguished in a particular area of architecture because he was an expert on all of the building codes in New York City to the point where um, builders and contractors would come to him if they had an issue and they needed to do some kind of an upgrade or some kind of construction, he was an expert at finding codes going back to, let's say, 1911. He was that specialized in what it is that he did, and apparently his daughter worked with him at the firm. It was niche, but very successful. So, you know, among his colleagues, uh, I read how so many of them were shocked to find out because they only knew him from the work perspective. It's quite a case. All right, let's continue on with the details here. So Rex Hurman has been arrested and charged with three counts of first-degree murder and three counts of second-degree murder for the deaths of 27-year-old Amber Costello, 24-year-old Melissa Bartholomew, and then 22-year-old Megan Waterman. Police say that he is considered the prime suspect in 25-year-old Maureen Brainard Barnes' death, but he has not been charged with Maureen's death yet. All four women were reportedly either escorts or sex workers, and they were discovered in 2010 near Long Island's Gilgo Beach. Now, most of you have never heard of it, and I grew up out there, I'd never heard of it because it's a really tiny stretch of beach and it's right next to Jones Beach, which most people will have heard of. Prosecutors allege that Rex Hurman was living this double life, raising two kids with his wife in Massapequa Park and then using burner phones to solicit escorts and ultimately murdering some of them, they say. The remains of the women, known as the Gilgo Beach Four, were originally discovered on December 11th of 2010. And in the oddest of ways, police were conducting exercises out there. And it was a canine named Blue who, while out there doing some training, discovered some human remains. And then that's how they ultimately found several of the bodies. It took over, over the course of several days, they found all of these human remains. Now, authorities have said that without question, they were murdered, but they haven't really given a lot of details about that. And there are at least 10 bodies that have been discovered out there. But police don't believe, or at least prior to this arrest, did not believe that they were all connected. That's why we're limiting this to the four, the four identified and the charged three of them. So I, I, I'm amazed at one aspect of this, and we're going to get into the details of the DNA and the cell phone data that helped zero in on this, but there was one piece of evidence early, early on, Robert. It was the description of a vehicle. And for some reason, initially, when this was investigated, it's not that this information is new, Robert. None of this is new, not this part of it. This was originally reported to police, but because of all sorts of problems with the police department and charges and allegations of corruption and then refusing to let the FBI in. And then finally, they reassembled and they got a task force together. What bothers me here, Robert, is that from the very beginning, this information about this avalanche vehicle had always been known to authorities. And apparently no one bothered to see if anyone in the area drove this vehicle because that's how they found Rex. That's how they found Rex 13 years later. Yeah, and the fact in terms of that they've used, we have advances in technology or in terms of DNA and cell phone um, location data. But you know, like you said, that this is information in terms of basic law enforcement um, investigation that even then that if there was some additional follow-up or any follow-up at all on the type of vehicle, it might not in terms of, of led to an arrest, but it may have allowed law enforcement to narrow the pool of possible suspects in terms of that you're able to see how many of those cars are registered 
in that general area or you know during that time frame and his name might have popped up as a person of interest exactly exactly and it was as simple as looking to see who had this avalanche and he came up on the list he was in the general area and then as they went through every single person who had the avalanche in the area they find this guy who also fits the description that was given at the time by a witness that included the the information about the avalanche also said he was like something like 6-4 and described the man looking like an ogre of all things and he is a very big kind of awkward looking man so those would have fit immediately and at the at, at the very least 10 years ago 13 years ago they would have narrowed him to at least a list but no right. that didn't happen and there is not one person involved in this investigation who has been able to answer the question how was this either one not followed up on or how was it missed it's there in the report it's it's there's just there's no excuse. This is the same problem that we're seeing in the Delphi murders of Abby and Libby, the girls who went for a walk on a, a bridge in Delphi, Indiana. And it took years, even though there was um, a video and there were composites. And it wasn't until recently that there's been an arrest. And the man that they arrested was a man who had been interviewed by Park Rangers at the time. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like the information is a nugget that exists at the beginning of the investigation and investigators in the Delphi case have said, oh, it's, you know, it's just, it was a clerical issue. No, 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 no. This is not okay. Yeah, I guess it's sometimes it might, it's, and, and it's unfortunate, but when you have so many moving parts and so many different people working on an investigation, that sometimes something that when we say in hindsight or appears to be obvious that this is definitely, it has to be important information, but the right eyes aren't looking at it at the time to give it, it or put it in context or give it its proper significance. I suppose, I suppose. Look, I, I know, I, I'm not trying to be critical of investigators, but these pieces of information which are very critical to the, potential solving of these murders, um, this is the part that that just undoes me because what we're really talking about is the loss of m several human lives and the impact of these losses on their families. Wow. And so at the end of the day, it's all about the respect for human life. And I know that investigators work really hard, so I'm not trying to be that difficult on that. I, I just, it, it, concerns me that these are kind of big clues, not little clues, really big ones, especially when they're the same clues that lead to an arrest years later. Okay, let's get let, back to the details. Police say that the victims of the Gilgo Beach serial killer had a lot of similarities. They were bound in similar fashions with belts or tape and burlap. All the victims were missing clothing and personal possessions, and investigators believe that the killer used the cell phones of the victims, at least two of them, and that's how they helped to triangulate locations as well with these phones. Now, Maureen, who went missing on July 9th of 2007 from New York, investigators believe that she was working as an escort and she was contacted by someone using a burner phone. Maureen had 16 interactions with the burner phone, okay, and now this is the burner phone that police believe is connected to Rex, who's been arrested here. 16 interactions between July 6th and 9th, so it's very interesting how they've been able to provide so much information in the arrest documents here. Uh, sometimes police don't release the information, sometimes they do. At this point, they've released quite a bit of the evidence they say they have against the man who's been arrested here. So according to the cell phone data, the last known location for Maureen's phone was on July 9th in Midtown Manhattan, right? 
All right. So just yet another, it's all circumstantial evidence, but circumstantial evidence counts the same as direct and yet another um, when you say rung in the ladder, but something else that is slowly starting to build the case against him. And then for the other victim, Melissa, kind of the same thing. Thus, her cell phone ends up the last known locations. There were um, there were connections or they were able to show that the phone was again being used in Midtown Manhattan and in Massapequa. This is after they're dead. This is after they're dead. So, you know, again, they may not be able to pinpoint it exactly. And what they're saying is, how interesting is this? In Midtown Manhattan, you have the victim's cell phone and you also have the accused cell phone operating in around the general area. This, mm -hmm. as you said, is the circumstantial evidence. There's far more evidence that I find um, much more interesting. So they were able to do this you know, for all, uh, for many of the victims to try and narrow it all down. So for example, for example, in Amber's case, she had multiple interactions with a burner phone prior to her disappearance. And then the same thing, the phone then showed up being used in West Babylon. Now, Amber, this is the interesting thing about Amber. You know how we've been talking about the whole uh, description of the car? Okay. This is key here, key, key evidence. Okay, so Amber decided that she was gonna play a trick on her, um, on the gentleman who was coming that we now believe, according to police, was Rex. Basically, it was gonna be one of these, like he comes over thinking something's gonna happen and then one of her friends is gonna play a trick and pretend to be the boyfriend, and this is what happened, pretends to be the boyfriend, screams at the guy, what are you doing, right? And so the man hauls butt out of there, the man being described as an ogre looking a lot like Rex, and they do it, you know, to play a trick and take the guy's wallet and stuff, okay? So that's that's what happened here. And then that man, the, the man who we had not identified, contacts Amber again and says, hey, can I get some credit <laughs> for the other night? That wasn't really fun. <laughs> this is everything that's been uncovered. And so according to police, then Amber goes to meet this man, whoever this man is, and never comes home again. But when they played the trick on the guy, that's how they got the description of the man and that's how they got the description of the vehicle, because he went over to her house. Yeah, so, and, you know, so when you're talking about in terms of following up on information, so this is a witness who very well, we probably say now we, you know, he did, but at least at that time, you have a witness who very well may have seen the killer, may have seen the person who last saw her alive. And that's information that, probably any, you know, rookie uh, detective or someone new uh, in investigation would know that this is someone to follow up with and try to get this as much information as possible. Physical description, what number he may have called from, what car he was driving, et cetera. Yeah. So that's how they figured out that they were looking for a Chevrolet Avalanche. And again, when they searched and they found cars in the area registered, they found one registered to Rex A. Huerman, who looked a lot like the description. And that is how this new task force started zeroing in on him. And from that point, they started building the DNA part of this case. So again, this is so crucial to the investigation. Okay, now we want to make clear that things had been quiet in this investigation. It had grown cold for a long time. And then finally, in January of 2022, they assembled a team again to look at everything from the beginning. And that's how they went to day one. And that's how they found the Chevrolet, Chevrolet Avalanche and started building the case. Okay, so we've gone. So we now know in real time, police have now zeroed in on a guy named Rex who lives in Massapequa Park who had a car registered to him that looked exactly like what a witness saw. Okay, let's move forward here. 
So Rex, who's 59 years old, and his wife, Asa Ellerup, and their two children lived in Massapequa Park, across the bay, across the bay, from where the bodies were found. And police had said from the beginning when dealing with a serial killer, they thought it was someone local. They had always said that. But local could, I mean, what could that mean? That could mean a 10-minute drive, a 40-minute drive. Millions of people live out there. Mm -hmm. So it's not so easy to draw a boundary and find a killer, obviously. So authorities allege that when Rex's wife was out of state during the time of each of the murders, and they can say exactly where she was. For one of them, she was in Iceland. Um, For another one, she was in Maryland. For another one, she was in New Jersey. They had all the dates as they're looking at all of this. And this is why it's very important to talk about the wife for two reasons. One, she was away when police say Rex killed these women. But here's the other thing. They found hairs on the victims, hairs which they could not identify for 13 years. They could not figure out. They knew one hair was a man's, and they knew that several of the hairs belonged to a woman, which was very perplexing, and they didn't know who this one woman was. Turns out, according to police, the female hairs found on the bodies belonged to the wife belonged to the wife, which tells police two things. They believe, that's why they've turned the house upside down out on Long Island, they believe that it's possible that the women may have been killed in the residence, meaning in Rex's residence. That's one possibility that could account for the hairs, because remember, she was out of town. Or, or... Maybe it was on the killer's body as they, as they were either fighting or, or whatever, and maybe there was a transfer. So it was, it was a link, meaning it was found on more than one body. So that was a continuous link. So how did they figure this out? They, they were watching Rex's house at this point. So now they've matched up the car, and they want to know who's female hair this is. So they wait for the trash to be thrown out and police grabbed like recycling bottles and they tested the DNA and the DNA on those bottles from the home match the DNA on the victim's bodies. So that tells them something instantly. It's not that they believe that the wife was the killer, but they believe that this was inching their way closer to the person they believe was the killer. What do you make of that? Well, DNA is compelling evidence. And DNA, what we're, you know, jurors often told is that DNA can tell you that someone may have touched something, but it can't tell you when the person touched or the last time that they touched, um, even though you may say that it can degrade over a period of time. So, but to find that hair belonging to the wife, um, I think they have to initially, or have to think at some point, is she a possible suspect herself? And this is why the her cell phone location data becomes so important because her cell phone information shows that at least her phone is out of state. In one case is out of the country, in another case is out of state at the time. So unless there's other corroborating evidence of someone saying, well, we saw her, we interacted with her, I think at most they can say is that at least her phone is away during the times of the murders. So then that leads them to say, well, we have her DNA on the deceased. And if it's not her, then it has to be someone that is close to her, which that and then coupled with the physical description causes them to narrow in on who they ultimately think did this. Right, right. They they were able to determine early on that they were not really looking for a woman But the woman and the evidence that they say they found is connected to the person they say is the killer, which would be the husband. It's it's very interesting how they did that. Now, that's not the only DNA um, that they did. At this point, now they're like very worried. Now they think, okay, we're on to this guy, but we don't have enough evidence yet, but we need to watch him. So they start doing surveillance. 
constant surveillance of him for many reasons. One, you don't want, God forbid, if he is the killer, for him to kill again hmm. while you're gathering your evidence. So he's under surveillance now and he's being watched and they're watching him where he's going. They're taking pictures of him. He, you know, he'll go into a store, he buys a, uh, another burner phone, he pays with cash. So police are now literally following him to and from Manhattan and what he's doing. Here's what else they're doing. They are now tracing all these burner phones and they're getting all this digital evidence of the sites that he's using, what he's looking at. He's on Tinder. He has all this fake email addresses. He's hooking up with women. How? This is a man charged with being a serial killer. How scary is this to think that for this period of time, the man's out there hooking up with women? Yeah. I, I, I can't. Yeah, and when I hear, so I go between in terms of thinking in terms of as a former prosecutor, and then I go in terms of thinking as a current defense attorney, how I would look at this case. And the other information of hooking up with other women and the um, terrible websites that he is visiting and the buying of the um, burner phones, all shady behavior, all things that make him a terrible person. You can argue that at, at least a terrible husband and or father, but those don't necessarily in terms of close the loop um, for, in, in my mind, in terms of looking at the case of this is our guy. The information that they have before is enough for an arrest, I would argue, and that you have DNA evidence, you have the burner phones, you have the burner phones and the victim's phones being in close proximity to where he is and the physical description. So I would say that you had information or they had information enough at that time to go ahead and make the arrest. But if they're trying to, if you're making the argument of it's a cold case and we're trying to make sure we dot our I's and cross our T's, let's see, can we gather any of additional information, but they don't, the, the additional information doesn't sway me. Everything you had before is enough to go ahead and charge. Right. And they were waiting for one more component, the male hair that they had found mm -hmm. and, and trying to get that DNA. They had to, you know, do it piece by piece. One of the things that police found very interesting was that his search history was pretty specific. In addition to the, um, some of the horrific child pornography and um, other violent websites that he visited, according to authorities. He also Googled the status of the investigation of the murders and the serial killer. So he was constantly Googling, you know, what was going on. This task force has been has been formed. Have they arrested anyone? Are they? So it was something that he was constantly searching for. Now, you could say you could say that anyone in that area would be worried about that and would also be searching that. It's just kind of interesting when you connect it to the person who's been arrested and charged here. All right, so let's go and discuss the, the hair of the man here of what they found and how they linked it. Okay, so investigators say that they found a male hair on the burlap wrapping of one of the victims. So at this point, they're already following Rex and they're in Midtown Manhattan where he works. He's ordered a pizza. It's still in its cardboard box. Throws the, we have a photo of it. So for those of you who are listening, the authorities released photos of the trash can, photos of the pizza box and the scraps of pizza crust that were left. Police say that when he threw the box out, they picked it up and they took it in for DNA sampling. And the DNA on the pizza crust, according to police, matches the one hair that they found on the burlap wrapping used. Now that's pretty damning. Yeah, and that goes in terms of when you have that coupled with everything else, but when we talk about DNA, it's hard to get around DNA evidence, because like we said, it can show that you were at a location, just can't tell when. 
but it does strain logic in terms of what is possible when you start to say that there's no reason for you to be in contact with these women and yet your DNA or something linked to your DNA is found on one of the deceased. And then we couple that with everything else. So that it does start to, well, not start to, it does build a very strong circumstantial case, at least at this point, against him. I do have a question, though. Couldn't his defense be, yes, I visit escorts and women all the time. I pay for sex. I've been doing it for decades. Yes, I had sex with all of them. That's why my hair is there. Well, I think, sir, and he would probably have to argue that. Um, in terms of the information about him still following up with escorts or still using escorts or, or sex workers, there's an argument that that may not be relevant if you're looking fast forward at trial, but I could see a judge allowing that to come in. So he would probably have to say that in terms of what we mentioned earlier, yes, I'm a bad person, I am a bad husband, I'm engaged in these types of acts, but I am not the person that committed that particular crime. There has to be, he has to give the jury some explanation as to why his hair, his DNA is linked to the deceased, or at least one of the deceased in this case. Well, on July 14th, he made his first court appearance. He pleaded not guilty and was ordered to be held without bail. And then five days later, on July 19th, Rex's wife filed for divorce after 27 years of marriage. Authorities believe that she had absolutely no knowledge of what was going on, and they say that she was absolutely shocked when police told her the evidence and what was going on. And in defense of the wife, I will say this, because we see this a lot where this happens with the spouse, um, and several relatives of serial killers have have spoken since this arrest to sharing on social media about how they didn't know that their father, husband, brother was a killer. They had no idea. People who lived with, you know, who were the significant others. So look, we'll see uh, what else is going to be revealed in court and what red flags may have been missed. But it's it's possible she may not have known, especially if this was all happening when she was out of town. Well, and for them to come out and say that she had absolutely nothing to do with this has led me to believe that they are believing her at this point, that she is being as cooperative and forthcoming as she possibly can. If there was any hint of her withholding anything or you know, spousal privilege in terms of I'm not saying anything, um, even though you know, she's filing for divorce. So I think she's doing the exact opposite. Any and every question they have asked, she is trying to give as complete answers as she possibly can. Well, his next court date is August 1st. And like I said, every day there is a new revelation on this case. It, it really is a fascinating one. And we will continue to follow it here on the podcast. Our next case is out of Minnesota, where I ask, how can a judge rule a man guilty of murder in one part of the case? A man who decapitated this woman in public. It was captured on videos. People saw it. It happened. There is no doubt about it. And yet, in another part of the case, judge can then rule, you know what? Not guilty. Not guilty by reason of mental illness. We touched on it at the very beginning, Robert. I am just so upset about this, as is the family of the victim. And I think many of us are having a very difficult time processing how this is justice. How is this justice, Robert? Well, I look at it in terms of cases fall down usually in one of two categories. Either they are a whodunit or it's a, this person did it and this is why. And like I said, this was captured in terms of people saw it. It is not in dispute in terms of who was involved and what occurred. So then it becomes a why did this happen? And when we look at it in terms of justice, we have to remember that justice doesn't mean 
retribution. And I'm not even saying that's what the family is asking for, but justice doesn't just mean or doesn't mean retribution. Justice doesn't just mean that a person spends their rest of their life in custody in jail when they have committed a crime such as murder or homicide. It is rare, as we discussed, for a defendant to prevail on a case like this. But from a personal um, level, I share the, the anger in terms of that family must have, even if I can't personally empathize with it, I certainly understand it. But from a legal perspective, I, I can't say that the judge made the wrong call in this particular case when the judge is presented with at least what the judge felt was such compelling evidence to show that the defendant suffers from some type of mental defect to the point that he can't appreciate or did not appreciate the his actions at that time. So there are consequences in that the judge did find he committed this act and there are consequences that he is not going to be out in the public, but will be confined to some type of psychiatric facility. Okay. Isn't it possible that they could have just left the guilty verdict and still have sent him to a psychiatric institution and have said that he was also mentally ill? Can't all those things happen at the same? What bothers me is changing guilty verdict to not guilty. Why can't he be guilty and also insane? And I think it might be a virtue of that particular jurisdiction, because certainly in other states, that's how it's done or how it's presented to the jury in terms of is a person guilty or not guilty, or is it a simply a case of, they say, not guilty by reason of insanity. So you aren't saying that the person isn't responsible and you aren't saying the person didn't commit these acts. So my understanding of it was that for that particular jurisdiction is two parts. One, are you responsible for the killing? And the judge rules that yes, you are. And then in terms of for sentencing, the judge is then saying, but you're not gonna be sentenced in terms of the first degree murder, but we're finding that you did suffer from this defect. And then that's why you're not going to jail, but going to some type of facility. But I just in terms of when you hear it though, yeah. it's certainly, you can say, well, that shocks the conscious because you say one thing, and the family may be thinking this is what's about to happen. But they knew, but I would have to say in terms of managing expectations, the family knows that this is what's coming, that this is the argument that the defense is making from the very beginning, and this is what the judge is going to consider. Uh, well, then I think they need to revisit this law because it is difficult enough to get justice in, in our system, but that part of it is the part that is just bothering everyone. Again, I can comprehend guilty and then we're, you know, sentencing and sending this person to maybe get some help. I get that. But to overturn the guilty to a not guilty, I can't. I absolutely can't. And maybe, maybe in that jurisdiction, they need to revisit this one because this is a perfect case, a perfect case that shows you how this law does not make sense. This does not make sense, especially when there is no question as to what this man did and who did it. There's no question. Absolutely. Right. Well, let's talk about this case because we've been talking about it for two years. And sadly, we are now so much further away from justice than we were when we first started this conversation. So 51-year-old America Thayer was killed in July of 2021 on a really busy street. Many people saw America being decapitated by her abusive ex-boyfriend, 44-year-old Alexis Sabret. Now, this heinous act, as we have said, was witnessed by multiple people. And the trauma, what about them? What about what was inflicted upon these innocent people who had to watch this? I mean, it's just there's no end to, to the trauma here at all. So there's no doubt that he cut off America's head. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I just, and this is a man with a document. This is the other thing that, that I think really gets people in this case. This guy's got a documented history of being abusive to America and other people. 
punishing her. The motive, he knew exactly what he was doing, Robert, without question. He was punishing her, as he had done for years. She did something he didn't like, he punished. Uh, okay, more into the details. Sorry, I'm going off here because I am really upset about this. So, Alexis Sabert has now been found not guilty by reason of mental illness for the vicious killing of his girlfriend, America. Now, America came to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic with her infant. She became, she and her son became U.S. citizens. Alec Alexis Sabert came to the U.S. from Cuba in 2007, and he has never obtained legal status here. Prior to his relationship with America, he had a history of domestic violence, including a conviction for domestic abuse in 2009 and a violation of a protective order in 2013 in Louisiana. Robert, this is not a man who just snapped because of a head injury at one point, which is what they're alleging here. Right. This is a man who has always been violent and abusive. Well, and that's certainly in terms of there's documented history of prior domestic violence abuse. All that information would be relevant uh, in terms of when you're talking about the guilt innocent phase, that if he was pleading not guilty, that, hey, I did not do this. Um, all that information would come in. Um, but without hearing in terms of the testimony of the psychiatric experts, uh, there has to be something for the judge. And I say this for the judge to rule the way that the judge did, that there has to be something in terms of that he doesn't appreciate or the defendant didn't appreciate his actions at that time, which even hearing about the case, I would question that because when you flee the scene of a crime, the argument is that you're, for, you're leaving the area because you know that you did something wrong and you're worried about being caught. Um, so I'm sure that was the counter argument that was raised by the, the prosecution. And I'm not sure how the defense was able to, to overcome that, but that's at least that had to have been part of the discussion as to why the judge didn't or wasn't swayed by that, by that fact. Unbelievable. In 2011, 2011, right? 10 years earlier, he was convicted in Louisiana on two counts of domestic battery and false imprisonment with an armed weapon. He was sentenced to two years of hard labor because Louisiana is not a state in which you mess with. Let me tell you one thing. This would not be going on in Louisiana right now. <laughs> there, there's no like you're guilty, but now like you're not guilty because you're crazy. No, not in Louisiana. Sabret was sentenced to those two years of hard labor. And then we fast forward to America and Alexis meeting and getting together. And this was 12 years ago. Okay. Now, police were called multiple times to their residence or wherever they were because he was so abusive to America. In 2017, Alexis was convicted of domestic abuse against America, the woman that he ultimately killed. The couple later reconciled, reportedly married. The family didn't like the fact that America was with him. However, what we are seeing here is a pattern that we see over and over again with domestic violence, control, and threats. The person, the victim who's being abused is too afraid, tries to get out every time they try to get out. It just gets worse. And this is one of the ultimate examples of it. Yeah, and I, sometimes I've heard people in that field or people who counsel um, women who have been victims of domestic violence, they may refer to it as the, the honeymoon period of where there is that that brief period of reconciliation of where the abuser is trying to smooth things over such that law enforcement is not brought in. And usually that's why I see prosecutor's office take such a hard line when it comes to these cases, that even when people say that I don't want to go forward anymore, I want to drop this case, the prosecutor's office will not drop it in terms of they'll still go forward with it because it's a defense against the state and that the victim doesn't have the right to not prosecute, doesn't have the right to drop the case. But so, but like this, all this in terms of when you hear it, the history of abuse involving other victims, the abuse against the deceased victim in this case, America, it would lead one to think in terms of just looking at it that he's not suffering from some mental defect. There is a pattern of doing this. 
uh, and he's fitting the, the pattern of an abuser. And this time he just escalated, unfortunately, to death. You know what his problem is? He's evil. He's evil and he's despicable. That is his problem. And he is absolutely 100% guilty of being an evil human being without question. In fact, even after the conviction, right, of this domestic abuse on America and he starts beating her up again, her family calls his parole officer to say, hey, he's in violation and he's hitting her again. And then when they come to talk to America, she denies it. She denies it, as we see a lot of times with victims in cases of domestic violence. As you can imagine, this has just been horrific for the family of America Thayer. But the one who has suffered more than any is her son, Charles. So here's Charles describing how horrible Alexis was to his mother. This was an interview that was done by CARE TV. This is your typical telltale ab abusive man, controlling man relationship for many, many years. And I can't even tell you how many times the cops were called for him beating the crap out of her and leaving her all bloody. But the evil does not end here. No, no, no. There was an incident. November 9th of 2020, Alexis tried to set their house on fire. OK. And he was confronted by police. He was smashing car windows with a baseball bat. There was a standoff with this man. And Alexis had a machete at the time, foreshadowing of what was to come. Ultimately, they threw him on the ground and they arrested him. How many chances has this evil person been given by our legal system. And ultimately, what does our legal system do? Gives him another chance and says, you are not guilty. Sorry, I can't help myself. I'm so angry about this one. So let's go to motive, shall we? Okay, so it's July 29th of 2021. America and Alexis are driving together to a court hearing about that arson charge. Who's paying for his attorney? America is paying for his defense. And apparently, while they're driving to court and she's standing up for him, paying for his defense, America says to Alexis, I can't anymore. OK, once we're done with this, we're done. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. And he unleashes a fury like you cannot imagine, cannot imagine. And that's what he does. He decapitates her. He rips her clothing off of her torso, pushes her out of the car, headless body, a foot away is her head. Can you imagine, can you imagine the violence of all of this? And then he yeah, takes off not, in an alley. Yeah, and it's not in terms of, even for those of us who may deal in these types of cases, when I say these types of cases, like homicide cases, and you can become jaded to a certain extent because you just see so many different types. This is still one in terms of regardless of how many of these cases you may work on, prosecute, defend, investigate, what have you. This is still one in terms of that the all others pale in comparison because of the, the level of violence uh, or brutality. A person who commits a homicide offense, I think there's an argument that they always are suffering from some type of mental health infirmity. Uh, and, and that's not, and I'm not saying this is, this always rises to the level of an excuse uh, for the person's behavior, but they, there's, there's always something in their background. Um, it's that, not normal, of course, it's right, not right, normal. Right. Not, not normal, not normal behavior. So there's always something in, in their background in terms of low IQ score, or uh, you know, low IQ score, not graduating from, from school, not having the proper support. And these are just things that I see in terms of just cases in general. And that's not meant to make light or, or say that that alleviates the, the pain that, that this family is obviously um, feeling or, or, or going through. Um, but for, to do something like that, uh, there has to be, and I don't, I'm not familiar with exactly when the brain injury 
had to have occurred or, or occurred in this case. 2017. He had already been convicted of domestic violence down in Louisiana before his head injury. So give me a break with the head injury. So the brain injury does not play a part of, in terms of in the Louisiana conviction or anything prior to that. So the judge is saying, so you did this prior, you have a history of domestic violence um, and you are a documented abuser. Now we look at post 2017 and then in terms of what type of brain injury did you have and what, what things were occurring that would, in terms of amplify that at the time. What's amazing about, I wanna get back to the scene of the crime. So as police are approaching the scene of the crime with this headless torso, you know, for those of you who are listening and not watching, America Thayer had a very distinctive look, beautiful, big, curly blonde hair, like really, really curly, lots of hair, very unique looking. In fact, police officers responding recognized America because of all of the problems that they've had in this domestic violence case. And so they were pretty sure they knew who they were looking for. Plus, there was the description and everyone saw him do it. And they arrested him down the alley, along with some bloody clothes and the machete slash knife that he used. So again, it just goes to show you how this is a really broken system. If the responding officers were like, oh, Lord, it's America. Right. Mm -hmm. That that tells you that tells you too much that this is a broken system. So he gets apprehended quickly. There's no question about who did this. And, you know, we were talking about the mental illness. So, so let's just talk about this brain injury. This is part of what went into overturning the guilty into a not guilty. Okay. So two doctors evaluated Alexis and they found that his mental illness prevented him from understanding, and I'm quoting here, understanding the moral wrongfulness of his actions during the alleged offense. Bullcrap, bullcrap, bullcrap. So there was a traumatic brain injury that was suffered in 2017 as a result of a car accident. Wait a minute. Who caused the car accident? Alexis. Because he was drunk. Can you, is there, can this man not be held responsible for anything, including his own freaking brain injury? Well, in turn, when you say, well, he is drunk, drunk driving a crime of, and that causes the, the, the type of injury. So I, I'm assuming that when you say held responsible, if he's charged with drunk driving, then he was charged, convicted, or pled guilty to that crime. He is responsible for all of his actions. He is responsible for his own brain injury. He is responsible for every horrible thing that he has done to any other human being on this planet. And our legal system is now saying, yeah, not guilty. You have a problem. You have a brain injury. I am so revolted by this entire case, as is the family of America Thayer. So here is America's son once again trying to understand this reversal. Hearing the words not, not guilty to murdering my mother, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to understand. It's hard for me to explain to my family too. So I don't know what to make of this. Um, we can complain and we can say this is wrong until we're all blue and nothing is gonna change here. Nothing is gonna change. The only thing that the judge has said that Alexis Sabaret will never be released again to the public I don't even know if I believe that. I'm sorry. I don't even know if I believe that. And he's going to be held in the county jail until he's transferred to a psychiatric facility. What a shame. So, and that's a small, probably, consolation or some solace that for the family that he will never be out again. He'll never be out on the streets. He'll never have an opportunity to hurt someone again versus in terms so he'll be kept in a hospital uh, versus in terms of if he had been convicted, he would have been the rest of his life in jail. Is there any cause, like, can he be deported at all because um, he was here illegally, he's been convicted of a crime? 
Well, that's, uh, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good question. So when I've seen it um, in terms of someone has been convicted of a crime, they serve their sentence and then they go into deportation proceedings. I haven't seen it though of where someone has received, or I, had, I don't have experience in a case of where someone has received a life sentence. And then what happens after that? Because unless like there has to be some amends, something um, if the sentence is amended to allow the person um, to be deported. But typically if you have a life sentence, then that's what you're doing. You're doing a life sentence and you're not going anywhere. So, but for this to be in a hospital, maybe that could be a little bit different of where they could say that, well, since you're in a hospital facility, then we can still move forward at the appropriate time and have you deport it. Well, if anyone can get away with a crime, it's this guy. So if there's a way out, he's going to figure it out. I, I, I think that part of his brain is still working. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about on social media. Our producer, Will Updike, is here now. All of you have been so upset because Will has been missing from the last few podcasts. We're really sorry. Nothing's happened to Will. Proof of life. Here he is. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still alive. My, uh, you can't see my hands, but I promise they're not bound. Um, <laughs> how's it going, Anna? Great to see you, Robert. How are you doing today? I doing Good. well. Hope you are. Uh, doing great. So this week we have a case of big trouble on the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad Trail. This case comes out of Anaheim, California, where a woman was arrested after allegedly trying to evade arrest at Disneyland by hiding near one of the theme park's popular roller coasters. So. Uh, according to an Anaheim police spokesperson, officers went to the park sometime last month after a woman allegedly entered Disneyland without paying. She jumped over the turnstiles. I don't know how she even made it that far, but officers caught up with the woman and apprehended her dear, near the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Uh, there's a TikTok video going around. I'm, I'm going to show it. It's it's a little bit difficult to see because it's taken from uh, another bystander from the views, but you can kind of you can clearly see like some police. A little bit hard to see the woman, but uh, the the police seem very out of place at the you know the happiest place on earth or whatever. Uh, but they are there. Uh, so the woman was reportedly taken into custody on a charge of defrauding an innkeeper, which seems like an old timey charge <laughs> that I'm I'm surprised is still on the books. Uh, but apparently for that, she could face six months in county jail and a fine if she's ultimately charged and convicted. Uh, just for a point of reference here, an, one, a one-day adult ticket for Disneyland costs between $159 to $179, depending on the day of the week, obviously, that you go. You go that is a crime. Times, you that pay is a, a crime. Bit more. <laughs> it's a crime that it costs that much? Yes. <laughs> How are you I supposed don't know. to How are you supposed to take your family? At prices like that, mind you, I've never been there. It was a thing I've never wanted to go. But how do you take your family at those prices? I mean, I agree. It's getting nuts. But you look at the cost of a movie ticket, at least here in Los Angeles, uh, 17 to 25 bucks for about two hours. At least when you go to Disneyland, you do get the full day. You get the full day of fun. Uh, if you don't mind, you know, standing on lines and being out in the sun. Uh, but people had a lot to say about this one. Angie S. wanted to know what's more expensive, Disneyland tickets or bail money. Uh, I don't know what a bail charge is like for defrauding an innkeeper, but uh, I'm still going to just go ahead and say that the Disneyland tickets probably would have been the cheaper way to go. Uh, Maddie S. called this a fast pass for a park ban, which no uh, no details there on if you get a life ban. I, I, I can't imagine they're, they're thrilled to have you back if you jump the turnstile. Although... If you get 86 from Disneyland, how do they tell? Like truly, thousands of people are coming in through that to, to through those entrances Face every single day. Face recognition. You, th you think it's that deep? I guess you're right. Oh, there are totally. there's cameras and stuff all over the park. Are you kidding? They use that like, oh, I could I'll go down a rabbit hole if I if I go down there. But yes, I agree. <laughs> uh <laughs> Hunter was actually impressed. They said, uh, breaking into Disney is like breaking into Fort Knox. So honestly, I wouldn't even arrest her. Um, I got to agree with, you know, the facial recognition and everything like Anna was talking about. I don't know how you get in there. I, I you know, I see pretty often. I was, I was just in New York at the beginning of the month. People hop the turnstiles there. Pretty easy. Disneyland, whole nother can of worms. I, I, I don't know how you do that. Um, I, I don't know how nobody noticed or, or she wasn't apprehended right away. Uh, Terry D said, well... Wasn't the happiest place on earth for her. 
which got a great, got a great, not a great day, not a great day. Uh, although apparently, if you're Anna, Disneyland is nowhere near the happiest place on <laughs> earth. So, uh, and uh, gonna wrap it up with Ray G. I love this one. Uh, they said, "I guess it is a small world after all," which I love the idea of the irony of someone trying to hide on the small world ride, which. Just as a note, I mean, don't try to do this. We're obviously not advocating uh, jumping to turnstiles at Disneyland, but I, I think you got to go to a thing that's that's less wide o- that's less wide open. You know, if you go to the it's a small world ride, there's you know there's animatronics and stuff anywhere. I, it's it's in a cave. You know, I think you could find some more effective sort of places to hide. Uh, but anyways, that is going to do it for today's comment section. Uh, as always, thank you so much for leaving those comments. I am. Still alive, uh, yes. so you can you can check us out uh, over on YouTube, YouTube on our community page, or also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, thank you so much, and I will see you all next week, hopefully. Oh yeah, absolutely. Are you kidding? They're they're very upset on YouTube. The people <laughs> are very upset because you haven't been around, and I've been trying to explain to all of them. It's just that it's just been circumstances, scheduling, <laughs> just. It's- Sometimes we do a really heavy case, and it's um oh, it's a little yeah. difficult for me to come up here and um, read some yeah. comments as great as they all are. Um, but thank you so much for your concern. I do so much appreciate it. And uh, as I said, I'll see you all next week. So take care. Well, that is our program for this week. Thank you so much, Robert, for coming back. We had some really tough cases, and I appreciate your perspective, both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, because you really can look at a case from both sides, and that's very rare. So we're so grateful to have you with us. Robert, where can people find you on social media or anything or wherever they can find you or your law firm? Oh, certainly. Uh, Once again, um, thank you for having me. I always enjoy being here. Um, I can be found um, in the real world. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. But on social media, Robert K. Corbett ESQ on Instagram, Threads, and Spill. I'm trying to keep up with the kids and being on as many social media platforms as I possibly can, even though they are time consuming. They are time consuming and sometimes wonderfully distracting. Uh, You can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. I don't always post about crime. Sometimes I do. My latest one is a photo of my retina. Robert, I went to the eye doctor this week. And they, you know, they check your retina. They do all the all these other tests. And they found that my retina is heart-shaped. It's the cutest little thing I've ever seen, oh. so I posted it. <laughs> so no matter how much venom I may spew about people getting away with crimes, I see you all with much love. <laughs> so uh, and that's our podcast. You can get this episode, all our episodes, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, You can get our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.